seminar today. Yes, it's always <laughs> recording. Uh, so we are uh, very excited, super happy to have uh, Peter uh, with us today, Peter Crampton. I think Peter is one of those figures who doesn't really need an introduction anymore, but uh, uh, Peter, uh, we are very fortunate to have him and our faculty at the uh, visa faculty here in Cologne. He's also at uh, Maryland and well has decades long research, uh, theory and practice and auctions, market design, real world experience in many uh, projects. So as a wealth of experience, among other, Peter was uh, on the board of Aircard, right? Uh, when the sad uh, disaster happened just a couple of months ago. And uh, so Peter and I have just uh, recently talked and I thought that's uh, unfortunately a great opportunity to share his experiences uh, with us about this uh, disaster. And this is really about practical market design lessons and which influence uh, certainly practical influences they may eventually have on real life. So I think without further ado, uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Uh, so like I said, you, you don't mind taking questions in between. So the absolute maximum we have about one and a half hour until 6.30. So with that, uh, I think I'll leave it uh, from here for you. So please go ahead. Good, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, I wanted to just set one thing up. So I have a pointer. Okay, there we go. Uh, good, so, and let me shift over the pictures. Good, I'm all set up now. Good, excellent. So this is a unusual picture of Texas. Uh, it doesn't usually look like this. Uh, winter weather is something Texans don't often see. Um, many people there, even, even uh, people of college age, uh, had never seen snow. Uh, so it's uh, most unusual and it resulted in um, an electricity crisis, uh, which also turned into a, um, a, a water crisis and a gas crisis and a transportation crisis. Uh, so that's the first thing to point out, that uh, there's many interconnected systems involved. Um, the lead role is, of course, the weather. Uh, that's what drove everything. Uh, and then I will argue that uh, failures began actually in the gas market and the gas supply, and that led to problems in electricity. Uh, although there were multiple issues with electricity and then the absence of electricity led to water problems. And of course, all of this is affecting people. And sadly, um, uh, Texans were harmed enormously by this, uh, both financially from extensive property damage that's estimated at $130 billion, which is a big number, just to put it in perspective, that is, comprises the entire annual investment, electricity infrastructure investment in the United States. So it's huge. Um, there were to date uh, 151 deaths associated with the storm, um, perhaps the majority of which were caused by the failure of electricity during frigid temperatures for extended periods of time. To give you a sense of the magnitude of the storm, this is a very nice picture of the three most recent cold snaps in Texas, which happened when the Arctic air from the North Pole uh, uh, is able to come down very far south because of a weak jet stream. And this picture here is the 2021 event. And you can see it is a 25 degree anomaly in temperature across every state of, of every county of Texas, which is the absolute worst nightmare for an electricity system because you're having a huge spike in demand caused from heating need. Um, in the absolutely everywhere in, in the state. Um, I should say that uh, Texas relies uh, predominantly on electric heat. Uh, 
So 80% of new homes are electric heat and uh, a majority are, 60% uh, are uh, uh, all told are electric heat. So when it gets incredibly cold, uh, it's a huge problem. And it's actually um, worse in Texas because a lot of that new construction is heat pumps, which are very efficient normally in the temperate climate. But when it gets very cold, those heat pumps turn into very inefficient resistance heating because th basically the, the heat pump uh, functionality is insufficient and uh, at extremely low temperatures. And so this uh, resistant strip heating uh, kicks in, which is uh, quite inefficient. Um, when we look, the, the big storm that I always heard about as a board member for the last five and a half years was the 2011 storm, where they had bad weather, extreme weather in the wintertime and in the summertime. Uh, extreme cold and then extreme hot. And the winter time, you can see it was, yeah, it was, it was bad, but it was nothing compared to 2021. And even if we go back to a, a storm that's much more comparable to the 2021 storm uh, in 1989, where they had similarly low temperatures, the extent of the, the duration of the event was much less. So this is looking over a seven day average during the cold snap and it is less extreme in the seven days, but at its worst moments, 1989 was every bit as bad as 2021. This looks over the last 130 years, uh, all the big cold snaps in Texas. And this actually makes clear that 2020, 11, while it was bad, wasn't nearly as bad as 2021. And in fact, wasn't a good metric if you're thinking of uh, sort of storm of the century, um, you really have to go back at, the, at these other events, which really are, are very similar with average low temperatures of around five and a half degrees. All the temperatures I'm giving are in Fahrenheit because we're talking about Texas. Um, so uh, this is important because February 2011 was the event that ERCOT used in order to assess its vulnerability to extreme cold. Um, and this, so, so there's a seasonal assessment that takes place before every um, uh, peak season, which is the, the winter, uh, before the, the winter peak and before the summer peak uh, to make sure that we've got enough resources. And ERCOT uh, uh, confirmed that we did have enough resources to withstand something like February 2011. That was the extreme winter event. But had they used uh, extreme winter events like, like 1989, then we, ERCOT would have said, we're going, there's some probability we'll have something like 1989, in which case we will have to shed uh, many gigawatts of load in all likelihood. Um, so this basically points to the, the issue of these extreme weather events, uh, extreme cold being the worst, um, are, it's really a question of how much do you wanna pay for uh, extra resiliency? Do you wanna just be able to handle storms like 2011 or do you wanna handle all these storms? And if you do, you're gonna to have to make some serious investments. Are you willing to pay for that? Now, in terms of the unfolding of the storm, it, so things got uh, quite cold many days before we, uh, there was any load shedding. But one thing that happened was a sharp drop off in gas flow. Um, Texas is the center of uh, gas in the United States and has an incredibly robust gas network, pipeline network. Uh, the gas generators, which provide a majority, the vast majority of the firm energy in a winter event are um, directly connected by pipeline to this gas network. And 
there's a lot of uh, purchase of spot gas uh, because it, it's difficult for a combined cycle unit to anticipate their demand and, and the typical contract is take or pay where you end up paying whether or not you consume the gas. And so lots of exposure on the spot market to this gas market. But what's interesting is here on uh, Friday, we're, we're experiencing large drops in gas flow uh, because, of the because of freezing. And this is days before uh, there's any problems with electricity. Interestingly, after the 2011 event in which uh, some amount of load was shed, a small amount of load was shed for a very brief period, um, the ERCOT did a study of all the past events uh, to see the vulnerability, because in, in 2011, one of the issues was uh, problems with gas. And so they did this study looking at the gas market and what sort of um, reduction in gas flows to expect based upon the temperature and wind chill. And when they did this, uh, it's very interesting actually, when they look at uh, temperature, the loss in production, uh, it's nonlinear. Um, it goes up um, much more strongly uh, at these extreme events. And if we look at this, so this actually is 1989, um, where the model, where the, there was a 45% drop in flow, gas flow as a result of those temperatures. And then in 2021, when we have pretty much the same temperatures as in, 20, in, in 1989, we have 45% drop in gas flow. So, you know, it seems to me that this was something that not only could have been predicted, but in fact was predicted by ERCOT's own report in 2011. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's quite clear that, that these kind of events are, are understood and the impacts are understood, but that uh, too little was done to uh, correct the issue. Here's another look at gas uh, production during the events. And you, you can see, starting on the 9th, sharp uh, drop, 45% reduction in uh, uh, gas production during the event. And 20, Texas is so big for the uh, nation supply that resulted in a 21% drop across the nation. Had a huge effect on prices. So here's the gas price in various locations. This is Houston, uh, $352. Uh, nearby Henry Hub, Henry Hub never went higher than $23. So these are the two biggest hubs. And you can see the impact all the way across into California. Um, normally the price is $3 and it was $2.50 just a few days before, and, both in Texas and in California. And here it is at 111 in California. It's affecting the price in, for LNG in Japan um, while this event is going on. There is extremely poor transparency about prices. Gas is a brokered market. Uh, there's some transparency about interstate um, the meters are actually transparent on an interstate level. So we've got quantity measured uh, on the interstate level. There's zero transparency on price or quantity uh, intrastate within uh, Texas. So this is a market that is far from what we see in electricity where we have incredible transparency of price and quantity, the market outcomes. Uh, and we have transparency even about the bid behavior and all sorts of things and have all these protections in place uh, in order to handle uh, emergency events. None of that exists in gas. Now, the interesting thing is in terms of who the winners and losers were this event, obviously there's a lot more losers than there are winners, but the uh, really the only party that won so far is the gas supply. The gas supply was heavily rewarded with tens of billions in windfall profits as a result of their um, unreliability. Um, and by contrast, the gas, the electricity suppliers um, lost money, uh, almost all of them. There were, I'm sure there were a few exceptions, but uh, pretty much everybody lost money 
And of course, the demand side was, was harmed enormously uh, as well. Uh, over the next uh, 10 to 20 years, we're going to see another winner, which will be the lawyers that are going to litigate uh, how the money gets pushed around uh, after the effect. Here's Saturday at 7 a.m. in Texas, and this is two days before any outages in electricity. We're already at the $9,000 uh, value of lost load, the price cap, or the shortage price. Um, and so you can see that this, the problems with gas are already having a huge effect in the Texas uh, market. First, I wanna look at it from the point of view of a trader. So this is a market participant watching the market and the information that they see, all of which is provided by ERCOT uh, in uh, real time. So we've got the, day, the, the, um, the real time prices here. There's also the day ahead prices with the dash line. We've got the uh, realized demand in real time, as well as the day ahead forecast. Uh, in demand. And what you see is that in uh, Friday and Saturday, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, leading up to the storm, it's already very cold. There's already big price impacts because of uh, uh, gas issues. And um, looking forward, things look very scary. So this is, as I said, Saturday at 7 a.m., in Texas, and the day ahead prices are astronomical. You know, normally they're twenty-five dollars, and now they're two thousand. Uh, and then you look farther forward at the forecast uh, load, and it is crazy high. Uh, this is these levels are above the uh, summer peak of 74.8 gigawatts. The winter peak before this event is 55 gigawatts. So this is over 20 gigawatts higher than the prior winter peak all time. Uh, and the reason is the heating load. Uh, they're anticipating more than 35 gigawatts of heating load in a system that is, you know, has a, has a peak of uh, 75 and a, and a winter peak of 55. So just, you know, astronomical. And this is all coming from, uh, not all, but primarily coming from industrial, I'm, I'm sorry, the residential consumers. The industrial consumers are basically shutting off uh, because every, so everybody is looking forward. At this point in time, Everyone knows that everybody, all the market participants and ERCOT and the PUC and the governor know that this is a, a very serious event, that many gigawatts are going to be uh, shed, that there's no way that the system can supply this, this quantity. And so um, folks should be ready. Here's a little bit later. Uh, so now it's uh, Sunday. So this is Sunday. It looks like it's about two o'clock on Sunday. And judging from the real time price here, and you, you can see, you know, it, it, things are happening just as you'd expect. Uh, there, we're about to have a shortage. And so people are anticipating the shortage with the day ahead prices um, at 8,000, very close to the 9,000 uh, value of lost load. Then here's the uh, event in total. And so what we're seeing here is that ERCOT did a re remarkable job of uh, being able to track load uh, right up to 70 gigawatts on that uh, Sunday afternoon. But then once we get into the uh, early morning hours of the 15th, um, the load skyrockets as the temperatures fall and uh, the thermal units um, start tripping off because of lack of fuel or freezing. And um, there's a huge gap 
And so lots of load to shed uh, between 10 gigawatts and 20 gigawatts uh, throughout the event. And basically there's no way to recover until things thaw. Uh, and so then things start to thaw on Thursday and we're back in business on uh, Friday uh, with no uh, load shedding. So inside the control room, uh, things get very exciting at 1 a.m. on Monday the 15th. Uh, we've already lost 35 gigawatts of generation. The, uh, and, uh, but we're, we're able to hold um, uh, 60 Hertz pretty well, but then units start tripping off in fairly rapid succession and the frequency starts to drop dangerously. At, at this point, uh, it falls below 59.4 and, and we're in, basically in free fall uh, headed to cascading blackout um, when the system operators ordered three gigawatts of load shed more. They'd already re requested two gigawatts uh, two moments earlier. Uh, that was a, enough to end the free fall and frequency, which is very important because if it fell below 59.3, then a whole bunch of other units would have automatically triggered off. Here, these three gigawatts wasn't enough uh, because we're, we've, we've now can sustain the frequency, but if, it, if the frequency stayed below 59.4 for another minute or two, a whole bunch of units would have cascaded off because of the automatic triggers. Uh, and so an additional 3.5 gigawatts was shed and that turned things around. The frequency came up and uh, after uh, this uh, final a major load shed uh, during this period, uh, we're back up to 60 Hertz. So the system was saved and that is incredibly important. And then throughout this, there's lots of more failures and, and then units trying to come back on and, and um, throughout the week. So throughout all these days, the system operators are working very hard trying to maintain the frequency of the system in an extremely difficult environment. Um, it was very important to save the system. So like I said, yes, 10 to 20 gigawatts of load was shed and that is terrible. Uh, and that led to four and a half million Texans out of the 26 million to be without power for uh, multiple days. But if they let this frequency fall much more and didn't engage in this load shedding, then the whole system would have come down and that would have been a huge problem because Texas does not have Hoover Dam, it does not have Niagara Falls, it does not have strong interconnections with PJM or some other system that can provide the inertia and control necessary to uh, have an effective black start. So black start would have been a very slow, challenging process uh, that would have taken at least a few weeks and more likely a month or more. Uh, nobody really knows. We practice black start every year but we don't actually do a field test black start where we shut Texas off and then try to bring it back. Uh, we, it's all simulated. So this is a, a pretty clear picture of the failure of the thermal generation. It's interesting. So all this failure is happening and mostly natural gas because that's what we're mostly relying on, but cool, coal is failing as well because Coal basically it's liquefied and then and 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 basically that liquefied coal before it's burned froze and so the, uh, a lot of coal shut down. Uh, there isn't actually that much coal anymore in Texas and it's all vanishing. But uh, the little there is uh, didn't perform very well. And then one of the sad things is uh, one of the nuclear units failed because of um, uh, freezing and that just shouldn't happen. There's no way a nuclear should be freezing, um, but uh, but it did. So that's, that's a problem that can be re, uh, resolved. Um, interestingly, during this, uh, sh shortly after uh, the controlled outages started, the governor got on Fox News 
and blamed the Green New Deal and pointed at, which we don't have in the United States, um, and pointed fingers at uh, renewables, this unreliable wind and solar that, that uh, was causing the problem, when in fact, it wasn't the problem. Uh, the wind and solar both overperformed relative to winter storm expectations, uh, whereas uh, the thermal units did not. This picture shows that in another way. So uh, here, the size of the circles, this is outages by county. The size of the circles uh, indicate the quantity of the outage, and the color of the circle indicates um, uh, performance relative to winter storm expectations. And what you have here is this, this all the gray and green stuff is the wind resources in the West. Um, and what you see, so this is before any outages began. And then Monday, we're starting to have outages. Why are we having outages? Because of the failure of the uh, uh, conventional resources uh, that are on the east where the people live. And uh, notice that their outages continue through the three, D, the three large days of, of impact. And then in the fourth day, uh, we're able to uh, eliminate those uh, controlled outages as the conventional resources started to come back on. And here's the, the end of the storm. So the story is pr pretty clear. Uh, in terms of prices, this was a huge event. Uh, er ERCOT has a very high uh, shortage price of $9,000 relative to most markets. And this price is reached, this is an administratively set price for uh, reliability reasons to make sure that we've got enough investment to uh, have a reserve margin that uh, supports the uh, desired reliability. That $9,000 uh, price is, is reached automatically as soon as we go into an emergency event and the probability of shedding load uh, goes up to one. Um, and then we stay at $9,000. And so that's basically what happened. So we, we, we jump into emergency and essentially it's $9,000. Here there's an issue because um, the market protocols did not anticipate uh, large sustained um, uh, outages, controlled outages. And as a result, it resulted in temporary uh, decline of price away from the $9,000. But um, the, the Public Utility Commission stepped in and uh, set the price pretty much immediately back uh, at, uh, or after a few hours. Uh, to $9 where it stayed throughout the storm. There are some issues about, uh, one of the big issues is uh, winter circuit breaker because this $9,000 price in a four day event like this, it's printing uh, over $50 billion. Um, and that's a lot of money. Uh, so what most markets have is a circuit breaker that, uh, anticipates that uh, you know, the market really has done everything it could. It can't do more in terms of getting more supply and less demand. And so it makes sense to actually uh, have a lower price. That's what a circuit breaker is supposed to do. And ERCOT had a circuit breaker, but the circuit breaker, like everything else, is designed for the summer peak, not for the winter peak. And so this, the, the circuit breaker was it's supposed to drop to $2,000, but or 50 times the gas price, whichever is higher. And 50 times the gas price is higher <laughs> in this winter event. And so that didn't help. And so the PUC clarified that, but probably what they should have done is uh, set up the circuit breaker here and then starting on Wednesday, um, uh, dropped $2,000, which was really the intent of the uh, summer circuit breaker. Um, but uh, they didn't do that, but they could have done it, in which case we'd be on this blue line. And another thing they could have done is end the storm early, which would have put us on this uh, orange line. Um, during outages ended here, and so that would have been a natural time to end the $9,000 prices, 
there was concerns about the reliability of the reserves when they brought them back on. There was enormous ramping that would be required because the demand would come on at a, at a uh, frightening pace. And the, um, so they made the decision to continue an emergency until um, this point on Friday. Um, and that was a judgment call. I don't know if it was the right call, but that was the call that was made. So there's been lots of calls now for um, you know those guys that were uh, had obligations to provide electricity but were short on gas uh, to and so lost a lot of money um, to reprice and drop to this uh, orange curve uh, ex post and the emergency early or to imagine we had a winter circuit breaker that looked like this. And so I, I look at the implications of doing that. Um, and the, it's shown here. Um, and it basically depends upon your position, whether you like this or which alternative you like. This is the status quo. This is ending the emergency early. This is uh, imagining a winter circuit breaker. And uh, basically, if you're uh, if you've sold a lot of energy forward, as most guys did, so most guys are, are around here, so they're all losing money. You know, typical forward sale would be around ninety percent of your capability. And um, you can see, you know, it, it actually starts not to matter too much when you're way out here, which was most everybody are. So really, these things they actually don't help much. But what they do do is they reward the unreliable units and punish the reliable units. The reliable units that, that somehow were able to, to get gas uh, or didn't experience as much freezing or were able to bring their unit back on sooner, uh, those guys are punished by this repricing and the other guys are uh, uh, benefit. Uh, now, of course, you've got very strong views if you didn't have uh, uh, sold a lot forward, but, but this is actually a much less interesting part of the curve. This shows an aggregate in Texas, um, sort of winners and losers. Uh, and as you can see, you know, wind is overperforming and is, um, as a result, doing quite well relative to um, um, expectations. And it's the gas units that are harmed the most uh, from this particular event. Um, so you can look at it by uh, company and see how they all did. And so this is the game that's being played out over the next 10 to 20 years, where all these guys are going to fight it out in the courts, uh, probably with the gas guys too, to figure out um, what should be done in terms of who should get paid what. Um, and this is just looking at it uh, over time. Um, and I'm gonna just jump through this again by company and by sector and so on, or, or by generation type. Here's a picture during the storm. This is the state legislature, very beautiful building in Austin, Texas. And you can see it's lit up uh, quite nicely as it is every night. Um, but this is during the storm. So there's lots of dark areas here too, which is much of Austin didn't have power. So these guys, uh, there's lots of Austin that's freezing in the dark, um, but the Texas legislature is all lit up as are uh, this building here that's under construction. And so part of the problem was the circuits um, in the controlled outages, um, the amount of control was quite limited. They're much too large. You know, ideally what you'd have is circuits down to the home level. So you could really, you could actually engage in rationing and uh, just say, cause we all have smart meters. Um, so you could see somebody's consumption and if they're consuming too much, uh, you could just shut them off. Um, and, and those that, you know, just like during the war, you might have to ration butter uh, you don't use the price instrument. Well, we could do the same thing here, but the problem is our rationing instrument is extremely crude. And so that needs to be uh, improved and certainly can be improved. But basically with the size of the outages that we had, there was what was supposed to be rolling outages were not able to roll because basically 
everything you sh they basically shut off everything that wasn't a critical facility. And so there was nowhere to roll. Um, and that, that was why people had uh, no electricity for multiple days. Now, the state legislature is also important because, um, and this is sort of one of the tragedies of the storm is the storm occurred when the state legislature was in session. Usually it's not. It only is in session uh, six months every two years. So, um, and this is a potential problem because the legislature can step in during the crisis and do stuff. Well, when the legislator steps in and does stuff during a crisis, it's usually a pretty bad outcome when the, the issue is a technical matter like electricity, which they do not understand. And so, so far they've been considering lots of legislation. The legislation is almost uniformly terrible ideas. And so far only one has passed both houses and it is probably the worst of all the bad ideas. Uh, and that is to ban retail plans tied to the wholesale price. So this is kind of comical for economists because an economist would say, well, a necessary condition of efficiency is that the consumers see and feel the real-time price, the marginal social cost of uh, use. And there were two operators, two service providers, Gritty and Octopus Energy, that offered such a plan, $10 a month plus the wholesale cost. And they um, actually instructed all of their customers to get off of their plan on Friday, several days before the outages began. Uh, they knew there was gonna be trouble. They uh, reached out to their customers via text, email, and phone to uh, either switch. In the case of Octopus Energy, they had a flat rate plan and they encouraged them all to switch to the flat rate plan. In the case of Gritty, they didn't have that in place and they just told them to switch to another service provider before the storm. Um, about half the customers did and half of them uh, didn't. And um, of the, those that didn't, and this is actually a very small number of customers now, we're talking about, we're down to about 20,000 customers out of the 26 million people in Texas. And these 20,000, um, the Octopus Energy Comp, after the storm, Octopus Energy said, uh, okay, we're gonna, you don't have to pay your bill. We'll just 10% just of your bill, that's all. And uh, Gritty, um, couldn't do that because they had more customers and they don't have uh, a deep pocket. And so they basically just went bankrupt. And, uh, but point is people aren't paying these bills. This is, this is unfortunate that the, these products, both Gritty and, and Octopus Energy were in, I, I talked to them in October of last year, encouraging them to introduce uh, a new version of their product which um, included hedging. So bought forward for consumers, uh, their expected consumption on a monthly basis. And uh, they were getting ready to implement uh, a, a plan with hedging, but they weren't able to do it in time uh, for this storm. So they you know, literally weeks away. But this is very unfortunate because this law is going to basically harm uh, price responsive demand in Texas, which is a, a big part of uh, resolving the problem. There's basically uh, two sides to this uh, issue. One is the supply side, which was primarily a problem with gas. The other is the demand side, which is a problem with all this heating. Uh, and what you need is if you had price responsive demand, the consumers would say, look, the price is $9 a kilowatt hour. I'm gonna lower the thermostat to 55, put on some sweaters and it's gonna be unpleasant, but it's, it makes financial sense. Then I'm gonna get a check for $1,000 at the end of the month for all this electricity that I, that I bought forward but didn't consume. So, um, so, and, sorry to interrupt, but uh, they have all that smart meters in place, which we hardly have in Germany, uh, very yes. low percentage.
but they don't use the technology literally, right? So they yes, really yes, they're following in Texas foot in California's footsteps. California, since the 2000 2001 crisis, installed uh, smart meters in everybody's home and never used them. Yeah. And now they're at least they're used for time of uh, use um, uh, yeah. plans, but Texas uh, barely has that. So they would have needed some automation devices, so I don't mean, intelligent devices, so that you know said, okay, yeah. here is you know X amount, you know you can do what you want, or you know they, we call them software agent that maybe then switch off right electricity usage, right demand control automatically. Right. Yes. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And and actually, a lot of people do have smart thermostats in their home, so mm -hmm. it's um, you know it would be a trivial step to. Um, to, to, to actually have that response be automatic. Yeah. But of course, for a sustained event like this, this is sort of the one circumstance where you don't need automatic response in order for the consumer to do something, um, at least eventually. You know, it's, it would have been very nice because it happened when people were, were sleeping, you know, 1 a.m. on uh, Monday morning. Uh, so the automatic uh, uh, the smart thermostats would have been extremely helpful if they um, were programmed to to do what Texas needed to be yes. done, yes. but that just wasn't the case. Um, so, in terms of the other legislation, there's you know one thing that the governor did right away. He, he learned that there were some non-Texans on the board of ERCOT, and so he. Um, he asked all the non-Texans to resign from the board, which included all of the independent directors, um, and such as myself. Um, and this is uh, th there's pending legislation now um, to you know part of the registra the, the the legislation is is that you must reside in Texas, um, but uh, another part of it which isn't yet resolved is um, who makes the appointments. And, um, but so far, uh, it looks like the legislation is going to shift away from independent expertise towards uh, political appointees, which is problematic because the PUC is already headed by, uh, all the commissioners are appointed by the governor. And so this is the point where the governor has their, their, the influence because the PUC uh, has complete oversight and control over ERCOT. Uh, so there's already plenty of uh, governor, uh, you know, capability to get his views in, and what is needed is independent expertise. Electricity is complicated, and the money involved is large, and for both of those reasons, independent expertise is incredibly useful. Um, the other things, uh, such as assigning reserve costs to renewable generators, uh, you know, this one is is pretty funny, but it's just a, you know, a, a way to penalize renewables and um, thereby indirectly reward um, fossil fuels. Um, there was a proposal by Berkshire Hathaway Energy to uh, step in and, and provide 10 gigawatts of strategic reserves uh, with a 9.3 guaranteed uh, return on investment. There was, um, uh, which is really a bad idea because you're asking the legislature to pick a winner and in fact identify a, a particular company uh, to do the job and by the way this is what we should be paid um, you know which makes no sense at all for legislation legislation should be about broad principles and um, you know in, in you know instructing the PUC and ERCOT to do their job and uh, um, give them guidance, not uh, you know prescribe particular uh, potential solutions. Um, but this one seems to be dying. Uh, winterization requirements, um, it's sort of all over the place. Um, whether to what extent we just suggest, we have legislation that suggests that people should winterize or whether there's actually going to be uh, penalties, enforcement, that sort of thing. Uh, natural gas is almost never mentioned um, as a source of the problem or that anything needs to be done, uh, which to me, looking at what happened is 
a little bit crazy because the reality is electricity is never going to be reliable in the wintertime in Texas uh, if gas is not reliable. At least for the next 20 years, uh, gas is going to be providing firm energy during a cold snap like this. Um, and if gas can't do it, then it's not going to happen. We won't have the electricity. Um, so other things um, as well. I want to make, I've, I've just mentioned reliability, um, but really I'm talking about resilience because um, reliability is what we often talk about with resource adequacy. Um, but reliability is something that one can measure uh, more readily in statistical terms because it, it happens, reliability events happen with uh, reasonable probability, perhaps many times during the during a normal year, uh, where you, you're short a little bit, 100 megawatts here and there, and and um, so you, uh, uh, it, it's more of a routine event. Resilience, and here the 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 events caused by um, sort of independent failures. Uh, so a, a large generating unit goes down, and, and maybe you know also you had a, a, a large transmission line go down, a and the wind wasn't blowing. But you, you have basically sort of a number of uh, independent events that are bad that happen at the same time. Resilience is when you have s systemic failure, and that's what a cold snap is, when a whole bunch of stuff freezes because of the extreme cold. Um, and resilience, you need a systemic solution. Um, and that's something that uh, we have to work on and we have to decide what we want to pay for. And probably one of the biggest areas where resilience in terms of you know, the, the big correlated events that can wreak havoc in electricity, I can think of two, cold snap and uh, cyber. So a successful cyber attack uh, could be absolutely devastating. And, and we're having in the United States now a uh, cyber attack of uh, a major gas pipeline, um, or not gas, uh, uh, it's a fuel oil pipeline. And, um, and, and then a, a number of attacks too to other infrastructure such as uh, hospitals, uh, ransomware attacks, um, and it's, you know those things are very serious, and the, we have to we have to be able to uh, to handle them. Uh, but that I put in the resilience category. <clears throat> How can we become more resilient? Well, we have to think about before the event, during the event, after the event, and then learning much after the event, learning from the event. So before the event, uh, resilience is improved by, let's say on Saturday, when everyone knows that we're going to lose many gigawatts uh, on Monday and Tuesday, uh, the governor should be on the TV telling people what to do in a winter storm. These are people that haven't seen snow, they don't understand freezing, so explain to them what needs to be done. Explain to them they need to find out where their water shutoff is. They need to shut off the water before the pipes freeze, not after the pipes are frozen. Uh, they need to you know, gather their blankets. They need to prepare for much lower temperatures so that all Texans can have as much heat and power as possible. So this is all before the event. That basically didn't happen. During the event, uh, we need to have more of the same uh, because maybe the pipes haven't quite yet frozen. So now explain to people, you know, as quickly as you can, you know, what to do to alleviate the most severe damage. Um, after the event, we need to recover as quickly as possible. And then perhaps one of the most important in terms of forward resilience is learning from the uh, understanding what happened and learning how you can improve the system to avoid an event like this in the future. And so that's the step that we're in right now. And, and you know, the reason 
that you're here listening to my talk is probably because not so much that you care so much about Texas, but that you actually want to learn about what happened in Texas so it doesn't happen in other electricity markets. Uh, that certainly is my uh, main motivation. One of the things that absolutely needs to be done and could have been done is improved communications. So this is the what I start with because this is something that costs almost nothing and is incredibly powerful in limiting the amount of destruction that occurs. And there's lots of parties that uh, need to be informed about various things. And each party should have very clear roles about what their job is. The system operator is, com is communicating to the market participants. The, they need to uh, be able to communicate all that information about the uh, the likelihood of the storm, and they do that with the seven day rolling forecast. So people know that this, this event's coming, so everybody and everybody should get ready for it. Um, and they're, they're informing not just the market participants, but also um, the regulator and the governor's office, uh, which did in fact happen on Friday and Saturday, well in advance before any outages. And so it's then that the ball gets passed to the um, governor to inform, he's the one with the TV screen on his face um, and he can inform the, the TV camera on his face, he can inform the public about the impending crisis and give them instruction on uh, what to do about it. Um, so big improvements could happen here and they should. So this is one sample uh, message that I wish the governor had told people once the freeze had started um, and the outages began that in fact, uh, keeping your home at a high temperature, irrespective of whether you had electric heat or gas heat was keeping other Texans from having any electricity and any heat at all. And so uh, please, turn down your thermostat and put on your sweaters. Um, that, that, that's the, you know, the public service message that uh, I would recommend for the governor. Um, absolutely, we have to solve the two biggest problems in this storm, which were the lack of gas so that the combined cycles can run and generate power. And then on the demand side, um, Texas has very low energy efficiency, and this is, you know, which makes sense most of the time, but it actually is very expensive when you have a cold snap and also in the summer peak. And so um, improving energy efficiency is a low hanging fruit that is going to be very desirable um, for Texans. And this is an area where the government can step in and support such investments through uh, grants targeted at uh, lower income people that are apt not to um, uh, take actions. Um, Quick comment. Wealthy homeowners can, can take action on their own, you know, such as uh, solar plus battery. So put the solar panels on the roof and uh, batteries on, on, in your garage and, and then you, you, you're taking care of yourself. A quick comment. My brother lived in uh, Texas in the 1989 storm, and at least in his area, large numbers of homes lost water because the pipes were not buried deep enough. Apparently, yes. they have no standards about that. It, it's not just electricity and gas that uh, has not really filtered its way into building standards and requirements. Yes. Yeah, that is an excellent point. I completely agree. And but it's also a wonderful example of where government can be helpful um, with standards. Now, one thing that you might be surprised about, John, is that the they may actually have standards, but they don't enforce the standards. So uh, that's what I've been told anyway. Um, and so there's really, you know, standards aren't any good if you don't enforce them. And the government needs to step in and, and have standards and enforce the standards. 
in terms of the building constructions because it yeah it actually when you're when you're digging the uh burying the pipe uh yes it's a little bit more expensive to bury it a little bit deeper but it's not that much more expensive uh and if you're you don't have to bury it that far to because the the ground stays pretty warm even in a seven day event um but yeah three inches underground is not going to do it you you definitely want to be you know 18 inches or uh you know perhaps more than that um and then you will uh, be getting a lot of warmth that's coming from from the ground. Um, so that sort of thing is uh, is very important and often very low cost. So that's why it's at the top of the list. Um, so in in terms of ERCOT, there's lots of things that can be done. Uh, ERCOT governance is actually, I think, uh, excellent. It's very good. Um, there's always concerns in an industry that's changing rapidly, whether the uh, regulations and the, um, uh, the, the, the stakeholder process is fast enough to, uh, to handle a rapidly changing future. And so it's always the case that we need improvements uh, on this dimension, uh, which I recommend. In terms of the electricity market design, ERCOT actually has arguably uh, among the best, if not the best electricity market design in the world. It also has arguably the most ro robust uh, gas infrastructure anywhere in the world. So it's kind of odd that we have this terrible electricity crisis involving both uh, uh, gas and uh, lack of extended lack of electricity um, in this environment. Uh, and, and yet we do. Um, I have a long list of uh, improvements that could be made, um, most of which ERCOT has, has uh, been, had ongoing initiatives on these things uh, because they recognize their importance and they just need to do more, uh, improve fork. And this, these are things that apply to every market in um, the world, as far as I know it. So improved forecasting, in, in, uh, better analysis of uh, uh, resilience and reliability through improved modeling, uh, encouraging price responsive demand, absolutely important. Integrating battery storage. This is something all markets need to do. Um, ERCOT has an initiative on this, uh, has for, for, for about a year and, and has plans for uh, integration of batteries in 2024. Um, as they do to accommodate distributed generation. Um, add a winter circuit breaker, that'll be an easy thing to do. There's very simple circuit breakers that for the winter that would work just fine. Um, I'm not a fan of repricing. I think it's impossible to turn back the clock. Um, the, uh, I do think that one thing that helps uh, on this score is uh, facilitating a liquid and efficient trade of forward energy. And so I'm developing right now a proposal for a forward energy market that would work very well in Texas or any other electricity market that enables the uh, highly simple, liquid, transparent trade of uh, forward energy products that are derivative of the real-time uh, product, which is the fundamental product. And would work uh, very well in improving parties' abilities to uh, make sure that they have a balanced position uh, and can manage the risk as best they can going into the real-time market. Um, so I think this is one thing that's actually uh, very useful. And I actually view it as a replacement of capacity markets and other resource adequacy instruments. Um, and it can be done in various ways, either in, in Texas, it would be a voluntary market, but it can be done as a capacity markets are in most places where the markets are mandatory. Um, uh, either way. Anyway, I'm gonna be describing that in greater detail in um, a paper that I should finish in a month or so. Um, there's also improvements in the spot markets uh, that can be made that better accommodate resources such as uh, battery storage. And 
this, um, so, so first let me talk about the day ahead market. The day ahead market, I would replace by a 24 hour iterative settlement that, that basically does the, um, the, 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 the day ahead uh, mixed integer programming uh, solution to uh, maximize social welfare subject to constraints every hour, which is typically what system operators do, but then actually you're, you're, um, you're posting prices and quantities uh, on an hourly basis in this 24 rolling period. And what that does is it gives visibility to price on a 24 hour basis, and, which makes it trivial to optimize the use of the um, uh, battery. Uh, so you get much better battery uh, use than you do with uh, other approaches. It also accommodates a greater variety of uh, needs based upon a greater variety of, of startups, um, for example. And finally, um, well, I guess it's not, uh, uh, yeah, that is finally, uh, improve the real-time market with a 30-minute uh, rolling look at. So doing something similar in real time where you actually are not just optimizing that one five-minute interval, but you're optimizing a number of five minute intervals on a uh, rolling basis. And here you could do iterative settlement or you could have just the settle uh, the uh, just once, but you know, quite frankly, you might as well do the iterative settlement because it's, um, it's just doing a little bit of a arithmetic and, and what it does is it provides the best incentives for performance, uh, which is very important. So th this fix your spot market doesn't apply to Texas so much. They have an excellent spot market. I just uh, described uh, two innovations that would make it an even better spot market, but um, it certainly applies to the European markets where we don't have uh, co-optimization of energy and reserves um, and we don't properly price uh, uh, transmission congestion, and that causes lots of problems and inefficiencies that I don't have uh, time to talk about uh, right now. But eventually, my hope is that Europe will um, move towards something that is uh, much more efficient. Now, with respect to longer term markets like capacity markets, where we think of it as a reliability product, um, one question is, is reliability a public good? And the answer is, yes, it is, as long as we don't have demand response. If we don't have demand response, then there's always gonna be this possibility of shortage and everybody is going to experience that shortage. Um, and, but if we have uh, much improved uh, circuitry uh, to have more fine-tuned controlled outages, and if we have um, price responsive demand, then all of a sudden it's no longer a public good. And then the, and that's actually very nice because it, it means that these um, reliability markets are less important. You, you always have to have a backstop because shortages can happen for systemic reasons, for example. And so you definitely need a shortage price still, but um, it can play less of a role as long as you work hard to encourage price responsive demand as all markets should. Um, in, in Texas, it's energy only market, as you know, you perhaps didn't know that we actually have a um, strategic reserve of sorts, which is two gigawatts of uh, demand response coming primarily from industrial customers um, where we asked them to shut down during an emergency, this was actually a little bit of a problem because some of the uh, gas supply guys, guys in the gas supply chain sold uh, this service to ERCOT. And so ERCOT's obligated to shut them off during the uh, emergency event, which uh, prevents them from producing gas or delivering gas, which would have been able to then produce power. So, you know, this is really something that it, you know, it should never have been allowed, but it, I, I just think it just went under the radar that people are so summer focused, they didn't notice 
But you know, certainly the guys that are selling this product, it's extremely uh, questionable behavior um, uh, because they know where they sit on the gas supply chain and they should know. The other thing folks on the gas supply uh, fail to do is that they there's a two page form. It takes about five minutes to fill out to uh, register yourself as a critical facility. You just need to say who you are, why you're critical, and send it to ERCOT and the distribution company, and then you get registered and then you're not shut off uh, during, during the crisis. Um, but um, many of the people in uh, the gas supply did not fill out that form and therefore were shut off. Um, so I actually, yeah, I can just say a couple words more about capacity markets. Um, so capacity markets all about buy enough in advance. And um, I've written a lot about uh, uh, capacity markets, uh, uh, much of it with Axel Lockenfels. And to me, my view on capacity market has evolved. Um, I, I think that their day is dimming. Um, to me, a capacity market is a bit like putting training wheels on a bike. And that, in fact, it's not the best way to learn how to ride a bike. Because the big challenge of riding a bike is balance. And a, uh, the training wheels take away the need for balance. Uh, and so it's not a good way to learn how to balance. And same thing with electricity market. The electricity market's all about balance. And you really, that, that's its core, core mission is making, uh, making sure you have that real-time balance. The capacity market can take away from um, the need to improve a spot market because it guarantees investment. And so uh, that you're gonna have enough resources there. And so even if you're, you have a really bad spot market that isn't providing the revenues that are necessary, you still get the stuff built because of your gas market, because of your uh, capacity market. So my point is uh, maybe it might be better not to have something that looks like this tricked out uh, kid's bike with training wheels and other, other doodad. This one's clearly gone through the stakeholder process and instead have a much leaner machine like this nice balance bike. And when I look at my own bike investments, uh, so I just got a bike and this is my, my new bike, which is a triathlon bike. And it is 100% design. Every component element is precisely designed to achieve a particular mission, which is to get as much power out of me and to go as fast as possible on a fairly flat triathlon course uh, over about 40 kilometers to uh, 100 miles, uh, depending upon the, uh, the event. Um, so as you can see, this one looks much more like uh, the, the balance bike in terms of its simple, simple elegance. <clears throat> These are some of the details of the Ford energy market. I don't have time to go through them, um, but I said a, a paper will be available. But what's really nice about this, the way to think about it, there are lots of products, um, at, at least uh, 2,300. Um, but believe it or not, it's very easy to trade 2,300 products simultaneously in a fully efficient way. Um, with modern technology. Uh, just have the, so, so essentially take a typical use case, a, a service provider that is looking at their load shape uh, for various types of day and hours of day. And essentially what they wanna do is um, buy uh, something that reflects their load shape. And as they get close to real time and they get more certainty about what their load shape is, they wanna buy, you know, ever, closer to their actual load shape. So they, so over time, they just want to make these adjustments to their purchase. And so it's, it all involves about moving from this portfolio to this portfolio. And both of them are convex combinations of these 2,300 products. And so we have, in this paper, I will propose a technology that my colleagues and I have developed for financial markets which enable us to easily uh, uh, transact efficiently 
those uh, many thousands of products with just two uh, price quantity pairs. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's very nice technology. And that paper actually will be available too, also in about uh, a few weeks. There's abstracts of both on my website right now. Um, this is the flow trading uh, methodology. And um, it involves periodic clearing like every hour. Uh, the sophisticated expression of preferences is just expressing uh, demands for uh, linear combinations of products um, that are uh, piecewise linear. And then we simply optimize gains from trade. It's a quadratic optimization. I can solve it in my laptop for many thousands of products in less than a second. Uh, so it's uh, you know incredibly uh, easy. As I said, we propose it for financial markets. This is just one simple example. But what makes this a flow, what I call flow trading, is essentially the demand curve is expressing your impatience with which the speed with which you move from this point to this point. And that's relevant because that's the, that's the way you want to express your preference because if you're really impatient, you're going to have a larger price impact and that's going to increase your trading costs. And so, so it's essentially this is the right way to represent preferences in these trading environments as flows rather than as stocks. And, um, Anyway, it's, it, it's, I think it's gonna catch on. And electricity is one area where it's incredibly powerful and incredibly useful. Um, so I look forward to, I can talk in greater detail about that on another uh, occasion. Um, climate policy is incredibly important. It's something that um, the world has messed up um, virtually in every country. Um, it's basically chaos. Um, it's starting to get a little bit better, uh, but really electricity is such a low hanging fruit. We need to quickly move to carbon pricing in the electricity sector. It's low hanging fruit. Um, I, every country should do it, but at least uh, Europe, the United States and China should do it and then uh, insist that the rest of the world uh, do it as well. And of course it should be done across sectors, but so much in market design is about having doing something right in one place at one time and then pointing to it so that the rest of the world can see how well it works and adopt it. And this would be a very good uh, example. When we look at climate policy or what's happening in the United States with respect to investments in electricity, things actually look pretty good. This is what's uh, uh, in the, 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 uh, the new entry in 2020, it's basically wind and solar. And when we look at exits, it looks pretty good too. It's almost all coal and, and some old natural gas. But the problem is when we look at the uh, existing incumbent infrastructure, it still is dominated by natural gas and coal. And that at the pace we're moving today, it's too slow. 4% is too slow. Very bad things are gonna happen uh, if we continue at such a slow pace. So we need to make this happen faster. And that's what the carbon price does. We, we, we basically know what's going to happen. We're gonna get lots of wind and solar and batteries to support it. Um, but we just need to make this happen faster. Um, and that's where modeling the energy transition comes into play. Uh, and I've been working on this in a large project, uh, uh, focusing on PGM, but, it, but it's applicable everywhere in the world to model the energy transition. Uh, and I don't have time to talk about any details. It is a, uh, a very powerful model that's actually, it's a many decade model that models PGM at the unit level on a five minute basis in all their, their markets, the real time day ahead capacity market uh, over multiple decades. Um, and it's a really powerful tool um, that is enabled by what we can do, what computers and algorithms can do today. Um, but it actually is, is forward looking with annual investments uh, for entry and exit uh, that are forward looking uh, with uh, correct expectations. So it's an approximate equilibrium model of entry and exit. 
in this model, we fully model storage as electricity markets should do world, worldwide. Um, so you, the storage resources can express their characteristics and then be optimized, optimally scheduled by and dispatched by the uh, system operator. It also fully models price responsive demand, which is gonna be a huge thing as soon as folks buy electric vehicles. If you buy an electric vehicle, you love price responsive demand. It is a way to get value from the monster battery that sits here in your vehicle. This is the equivalent of seven power walls in this Model S. Uh, and so it's just a huge quantity of storage that everyone with an electric vehicle will have. Um, and then of course, there's this other uh, innovation. I already have the electric vehicle, that Model S in the garage, um, but actually this next month or two, uh, that garage is also gonna have these solar panels and um, additional uh, four more batteries. Uh, so that, that uh, uh, so I'll, I'll have uh, distributed generation. And the, um, that's the future. That's what we need to uh, build into our electricity markets. The final thing that I wanna mention is interconnection. Texas is unusual. Uh, we essentially sit as an island uh, with very weak interconnections between uh, Mexico, the Western interconnection and the Eastern interconnection in the United States. And uh, one thing that would be desirable is to strengthen these connections with very large uh, DC uh, coupling, uh, which is uh, certainly possible. It's just gonna take a while but it was actually be beneficial for Texas because Texas right now sits as the energy capital of the United States. Soon it's gonna be the legacy energy capital of the United States. But alternatively, we could build this interconnection and then it could become the future energy capital of the United States exporting vast quantities of very economic wind and solar to the rest of the US. So that's my vision for Texas and hopefully that vision will be shared by, uh, uh, by others. But one thing is for certain, it's not going to happen in 9.5 seconds. That is something that is going to take uh, at least 10 years and probably 20 years. Uh, so we need to do all that other stuff that I mentioned first. And yes, we should be talking about interconnection, but the the interconnection is the, the, the long-term solution. So with that, let me, I still have time for questions. Well, thank you so much, Peter. This was just a fantastic talk. Share your insights, uh, <clears throat> really fantastic. Uh, coming directly from the source. So uh, thanks again. I think we have about 10 minutes uh, left. Uh, let's open it up for questions. I think there should be a lot of you know, questions or at least thoughts, comments, and anybody. They're still in awe because you gave so much information <laughs> right to I all <laughs> process all that information. <laughs> John, you want to ask a question and you need to unmute us. Oh, yeah, you're on mute, John. Uh, it's been very interesting for me uh, living in the U.S. and having heard about it in real time. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of interesting detail that, uh, particularly on the structure of those markets, that I really had not understood. Very nice. Thank you. So one thing, John, I noticed you have a. It looks like you've got a wood burning stove. Uh, yes. Yeah. So that's a very good example of resilient heating. Uh, <laughs> and so. I don't know how many Texans are gonna put in a wood burning stove, but if you had a limited, if one had a limited amount of money and you wanted winter resiliency, that's what I would recommend. Uh, if you've got a lot of money, then go with the solar panels and the battery. Well, we also um, have the solar panels. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> are you living in Texas? No, I'm living in Wisconsin. Okay. <laughs> uh, where, where we have to buy, we're required to bury our water pipes at least two meters down. Two meters, yeah. Yeah, well, Texas is a different situation. So uh, I go to board meeting, I used to go to board meetings every two months. And um, so, I, so I'd be staying there a couple nights every two months. 
And one of the things in Texas is sort of around the year, I never had to use the hot water when I took a shower. I just put it on <laughs> cold 100%. <laughs> Robin, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Hi. Um, yeah, I actually just wanted to maybe make a quick comment um, as an expat. I'm from California and I've been living in Germany now for 10 years. And where I'm from in California, it's very common to have blackouts. We lost electricity all the time. Um, and I just think it's very interesting also how you talk about distributed generation. You're saying you want to have four batteries and solar panels, this whole kind of concept that someone is energy independent. That's like a very, I think a very American mentality. And uh, in Germany, especially, I mean, in Europe in general, the whole concept of having four batteries and all this backup power and it, it, people think you're crazy. <laughs> I mean, in terms of like, why should someone be energy independent when they're you know, a part of this whole energy system? So it's yes. interesting to also hear that perspective because I, you really don't hear that here. I mean, you really right. don't. This whole this whole concept of I'm going to make myself energy independent. That's very kind of like a, a like a kind of out there idea that yes. um, I think it's just starting to come here slowly. <laughs> yes, and Texas is an outlier on the independence front, but all Americans have um, are, are more independent in in this regard. Um, and one of the reasons actually is incentives. So in the United States, we do have most neighborhoods have uh, a much higher frequency of outages than we do in Germany. And so in particular in my home, in, in I lived for almost 30 years in Washington, DC. And so major metropolitan area, uh, just 15 minutes from the White House. And we would routinely, every other year, we would have a five day outage. Uh, because a bad hurricane would come through, or not a hurricane, a bad thunderstorm would come through, and uh, trees would go down, and I would be the last, uh, you know, even though I'm in a city, uh, it would take a while for the distribution company to come and fix the lines, because all the lines are uh, above ground. Um, and so, you know, that's part of it. So a third of my neighborhood had whole house generators. Uh, after going through this for many, many years. Um, and uh, a 10 minute outage because of a squirrel on a, a transformer or something, that would happen once a week in Washington, DC. Here in California, the, the weather is uh, much more temperate and I'm, I'm, I'm especially for me right close to the sea. And so the, and we don't have the big thunderstorms, so there's uh, it's much more reliable. Nonetheless, I am, you know, so why am I getting these solar panels and the battery backup? And the reason is, you know, one, I'm sort of used to it because of the experience in Washington, DC, but the other is because of price. So in California, we have net metering, which is uh, driving up uh, the retail price astronomically. My, uh, at, on peak, I pay uh, over 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Whereas off peak, super off peak, I pay nine cents, all in distribution and transmission charge. In fact, the whole bill, it's almost distribution and transmission charge. Uh, there's $3 for, I'm sorry, three cents for the, um, wholesale cost of uh, electricity, and then the rest is distribution and, and transmission. And so basically it's economic for me to put on these uh, the solar panel and to have the batteries um, so that I basically never can consume on peak. I'm just consuming a little bit on super off peak. So I've just been motivated and, and you know what's happening is more and more people are doing what I'm doing, especially those with uh, financial means. And so it's shifting, this net metering shifts more and more of the fixed cost, which is charged for distribution transmission, which is charged on a per kilowatt basis, 
onto a smaller and smaller group of people. And who are those people? Those are the, all the poor people in California. So it's, you know, it's basically, they've got this uh, promotion for solar panels that's benefiting the rich and hurting the poor. And it really isn't doing much for the climate either because the guys that are deciding whether to, to uh, get an electric vehicle are thinking, well, you know, really should I when I'm paying, you know, between 50 and nine cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, which is super high compared to what's paid in Texas. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. I think it's really interesting for my colleagues to hear you talk about this. It's very yeah, and it's actually, it is super <laughs> important in the United States and elsewhere that the, the, the way that the, the retail rates are incredibly important in affecting behavior. And today, uh, there is a huge disconnect between marginal social cost, the efficient pricing, and um, what consumers pay. And that needs to be fixed. California is the lead example on how not to do it. And hopefully the rest of the world can watch California again because the whole thing is completely unsustainable um, and, and leading to you know, all sorts of uh, these strange behaviors. But, it, but it's absolutely critical. It's, it's actually probably more important than the improvements that we're making in the wholesale markets, which are also important. But uh, I just think that there's this, uh, this great need to fix retail pricing. And that will be true in uh, Germany as more Germans uh, get solar panels and this whole issue comes up. Yeah, that's true. One more, uh, I'm, I'm on a uh, rural cooperative. I'm actually on the board of the rural cooperative. Outages are extremely rare, but I've become uh, disenchanted with the notion of net metering because it makes it impossible for other pricing schemes to have much impact on solar owners. Yeah, you should. I, you know, net metered, net metering is unsustainable. Uh, yeah. It is. And so, sometime I'd like to get pick your brain about what's a better solution. But probably so the better solution. Well, I can just do that in one second. Okay. The better solution is to allocate the fixed cost the way Ramsey would have you allocate the fixed cost. You know, think like an economist. You want mm -hmm. to. You've got this fixed cost. You want to put the fixed cost where you're going to have the least distortion and do it in a way right. that creates the least distortion. Right. And the way to do that is to, the way I do it in the United States, is allocate the fixed cost uh, based upon home value. So we've got very good transparent measures of home value. Just take the average of uh, Zillow and Win and uh, Redfin, <laughs> and uh, that would be very good. Uh, it would be wonderful for equity. It would be wonderful for efficiency. Um, so a very simple, straightforward solution. Um, so, and I'm hoping something like that would catch on. And, I, and you know, the reality is the guys buying expensive homes are not going to get upset about that. Uh, I think, you know, people, at least that's, that, that, that would be my, my hope. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've got a bigger fish to fry. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Um, yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering a little bit about the um, retail market in, in Texas. So you mentioned briefly like the irony in outlawing what Gritty and Octopus Energy did. And I was wondering to what degree the heterogeneity in tariffs that exist and some people having flat tariffs actually um, exacerbates the, um, the crisis that there is because there are not economic incentives for some people to react to the prices because they don't see the prices, whereas others are completely um, um, completely under the bus there. Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, and in fact, it's uh, 25.9 million people that do not see or feel the uh, real-time price. Uh, so it's really these just a few outliers that uh, obviously can't do all the work. Texas has actually helped in the price responsive demand side because of large industrial use. And Germany has a fair amount of industrial use as well that's helpful because all that load uh, is price responsive. 
But retail consumers are incredibly important as this storm illustrates. And we need to have um, a variety of plans to uh, accommodate the variety of uh, customers. Um, and so right now, Texas, it's, uh, as I said, 99.99% flat rate plans. Um, but there is a diversity of plans and Texas has retail choice, which encourages that, uh, which is uh, a, a good way to do it. But it also requires uh, regulation because otherwise the businessmen are going to be clever enough to find ways to uh, rip consumers off with plans that aren't really in their interests. Um, so the and the Public Utility Commission has done a pretty good job on that in Texas, but um, um, that's something that every market should should also take take very seriously. Um, but I do think that we're, we're going to see a lot of innovation in plans. Uh, over the coming years, and we should. The reason that we haven't seen that innovation is quite frankly that electricity has been so darn cheap. That's why it hasn't happened, why, why consumers haven't adopted more innovative solutions in uh, Texas. They've been much more innovative actually in California. And the reason is the prices in California are four times as high as the prices in Texas. So people just can't be bothered. And really they shouldn't be bothered when if it's super cheap, um, there's there's no reason to pay any attention to something that's forty dollars a month, and you know who cares? But um, that will change as we go through this energy transition. Uh, things are going to become a bit more expensive, and the tools with which to manage um, electricity consumption in more efficient ways are going to be improved. Um, all the smart home stuff is going to be uh, easier. And I, I suspect Texas, is, is, Germany is in a similar situation to Texas where it really isn't such a large part of one's bill that uh, one thinks about it too much. But then I also suspect that there's been even less innovation with respect to plans in Germany. Um, I really haven't heard of anything, uh, but perhaps you, you guys know more about uh, plan innovation in the German market. Okay. But it is the future. Yeah, for sure. That's what we are researching a lot on different retail tariffs and also including the storage and automated devices acting on behalf of the people, for sure. Uh, Mark, maybe one more question and then maybe close. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I, I was wondering what, what, what do you think would have been the efficient way to um alternative uh, to 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 dealing with uh, with with the situation if one had uh, been more uh, uh prepared so how much of the load shedding was actually efficient given the situation i mean i i, I obviously i understand if the if, if the gas grid would have been 100 percent reliable then you wouldn't have had the load shedding uh, right. But obviously, in order to uh, have the gas grid uh, been 100% reliable in such a uh, critical weather situation would have required some form of investment into the gas infrastructure. And comparing this to the load shedding what, what, for this very small probability of, of a weather situation, what, what would well, actually have been a, a, an efficient way to, to go about this? So. Yes, so I so I think basically the efficient way to go about it would have been uh, following the my lessons learned in the order that I presented them. So I think effective communication would have eliminated maybe uh, ten gigawatts of load shedding. Um, you know, maybe only five, but it would have been it would have better communication would have uh, eliminated some number of gigawatts of load shedding. Now. Um, uh, yeah, fixing the gas market would have uh, eliminated all the load shedding, but I actually don't think that they're going to be able to fix the gas market. I, it's a highly captured market in Texas, and I don't think that they have the incentive to fix it, and so there's not going to be the political will to fix it. So I think we just sort of have to accept that gas is going to be broken. Then the question is, what should we do about it? Well, 
with enough time, um, it's not gonna be a single thing, it would be multiple things. But one of the things I would have done um, if I had had additional time is I would have um, greatly enabled um, price responsive demand. Um, I would, uh, and, and demand response programs that, so improving the, the if you can't uh, have reliable gas, then what you need is either to store, you need to work on supply, you're gonna to have to have storage, large storage of uh, gas at the, at the combined cycle plants. So large LNG storage tanks. So that's one solution to make gas, uh, to, to address the gas unreliability. The other solution is on the demand side. And the demand side, uh, there I would improve the circuitry so that we actually can ration uh, much more efficiently than we do. Um, and in, in fact, to the point where the, uh, the, the, the governor can, can basically say, you know, this is, this is what we expect your home to consume as it has in the past. And you're gonna have to reduce by uh, 5% or 10%. And if you don't, uh, we're gonna cut you off when you've uh, reached your limit. Um, so that would basically eliminate, uh, I think all of the inefficient load shedding. So all of the load shedding I would view as inefficient. Uh, there was alternatives that could have been done uh, if they had the technology and if, they, if folks had the information. Um, so I think that those plans should be in place. I, I also think that they need to, to practice an event like this, just like we practice Black Start every year. I think it would have been very helpful if the PUC and the governor's office uh, did a little practice with ERCOT and the distribution companies uh, to practice an event, who's gonna do what with regard to communication, how they're gonna respond to, um, uh, to events, uh, as they develop, you know, to me, this was predictable. Not only was it predictable, it was predicted. And so we just, uh, you know, should have been, so I don't accept any of the load shedding as efficient, uh, that, you know, the right cost benefit analysis was done and it was just too costly to address. I don't accept that. Well, that's maybe a good, uh, in a way, ending that we don't accept what's happening and that we look uh, to the future and how to improve it. And uh, Peter, we are already in contact about the demand side. So I'm looking forward to continuing that. So I, I think that is now a great place to thank you very much for your wonderful uh, and insightful presentation. I think it's, uh, it's really wonderful to get this first, uh, you know, inside from you from the front line so to speak right from the trenches right so that is really a uh, excellent thing so wonderful i think we could continue easily the uh, discussion here uh, a couple more hours <laughs> so from that one but uh we are looking forward actually to invite you soon again to report about your other uh, multiple projects you have been going on uh you have been some nice appetizers on the way here. So we are really looking forward to that. So Good. really, really great. So I think that brings us to the end uh, of uh, today's AV seminar. Thanks to Peter, thanks to everybody for being here for your uh, questions, discussions. Uh, looking forward to continue that. Good. Thank you so much. Well, thank